see. Okay, today is February, February 28, 2015. It's uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, this is Aaron Murakami, and on the line I have uh, Eric Dollard and John Polakowski. Um, I am recording this call, and so if uh, you know anybody who wanted to be on but couldn't, this will be um, posted on YouTube here shortly. And so um, if you're just logging on, go ahead and uh, hit 4 star sign, and that will mute your own phone. Um, and then what we're going to do is just go over a couple updates, and then we'll open up for live questions. And if you have any questions for Eric or John, when we do open up for questions, just hit five star sign, and that will give me a little flag on my screen so that I know that you want to ask a question, and I'll unmute you, and I'll just read off like the last four digits of your phone number so you know you're the one being unmuted for the uh, uh, to ask your questions. Um, so right now, John Polakowski is uh, actually down at the lab with Eric, and they've been working on some experiments. And um, John, do you want to kind of uh, explain kind of the purpose of your trip and what you've been working on since you've been down there for the last week? Yeah. So, so what I've been doing is, uh, is I built this um, analog transmission network that Eric designed um, that is supposed to uh, validate. Um, his uh, model of of creating a, a Tesla coil in a in a uh, lumped lumped um, element instead of distributed network, and that's what we've what we've built. And uh, we it took three four days to actually build it, but um, we we started doing tests on it today. So it's it's looking good so far. Now, is that similar to like what Eric demonstrated in some of the old Borderlands videos, where there's a bunch of, I think, maybe like resistors and capacitors in this little network, and it kind of went cold to hot or hot to cold or something? It was kind of like counterintuitive to what, what most people would think was going on? Uh, I think you'd have to ask Eric about that, because I'm not too sure. Yeah, it's, it's the okay. same, pretty much the same thing. So what we're doing right now is uh, we're attempting with the... Uh, limited materials on hand that aren't the right value to get a close enough impedance match for the loading networks that are going to go up on the telluric antenna. So we're starting with okay. its component, component waves and then uh, determine what their frequencies and impedances are going to be and then composite them into the final network, which uh, I don't think there will be enough time this time around for John to do that. Plus, I have to uh, run off. I have this complication uh, with my eyes that's kind of putting me out of business. So, so at any rate, we're trying to get done what we can here inside the uh, the walk-in refrigerator. It's about 48 in here right now. Okay. So that so that um, analog network you're building is directly related to the seismic project. Is it like a uh, small scale? model and when you with the actual telephone lines up you're basically going to do the same thing but on a large scale is that kind of the idea well the thing is is the, is the network uh counteracts the telephone line so even by itself on the bench it'll do the same thing as well when it's distributed out on the poles so this is like the final network we have to come up with some kind of final design and then and then by the end of the year hopefully we'll have all those networks attached we're still missing an awful lot of stuff. So, anyway, we're just going to see the coils I have. It's basically, it's the same thing as Landers, but I do not have the same coils. Uh, I got coils that I got from somewhere else, so it's going to throw the impedance off. Uh, the problem here, unlike Landers, is I cannot get a conductive ground, so it's going to be all these complications and boring holes into the earth and and picking up capacitively, and that's going to require higher impedance. So this is not something that I can just go to the radio engineering manual and get the answers for. It. So that's why there's a lot of experimenting going on right now. Okay. And, John, you're there for maybe just a couple more days? You might be taking off. Yeah, I'm going to, so. I'm, I'm going to be here till till Monday. So um, I'm going to be leaving on Monday. Now, what's the um, like, like? What kind of progress have you been? I know a lot of people are wondering about the cosmic induction generator project, and since um, the conference last year when you demonstrated it at the lo the low power uh, level, where you were able to get you know some of the electrical flames off the uh, rings, 
Um, yeah. What have you been doing with that project um, in the last, you know, nine, eight months or so? Yeah, so um, at the last conference, conference, one of the things we discovered is that there's a huge impedance mismatch between the transmitter and the, the parallel resonant circuit of the primary. And um, so after that, um, the, what needs to be done is a impedance matching network can need to be created to um, make sure more of the power got into the coils. And uh, so basically, I, I spent the past few months um, designing that network and then um, kind of refining it, and now I'm ready to build it. Now, the um, 2015 Energy Conference is coming up in the middle of July. Do you know if, um, uh, I mean, you're going to be presenting on something different, that, you know, than the right. cosmic induction generator this year, but do you know if um, you might be bringing up the cosmic induction generator to do a demo at, at the higher power? Well, I'm certainly going to try to. Um, I don't think we would have it at the one kilowatt level, but maybe the maybe the 500 watt level. Um, uh -huh. I, I I I foresee it being you know uh, possible to happen. Um, there's always you know all kinds of uh, unpredictable things that can happen, but but for the time being, I I don't see any reason why uh, it shouldn't happen. But even 500 watts is quite a, quite a bit more than than what it was. Um, what was yeah. the original power level you were working at? Well, I think uh, at the the conference this past summer, it was at 100 watts. But um, we ended up having a burn down and um, a couple of equipment problems. Um, part of it due to that impedance mismatch, we, we burned up the coax that was um, leading into the, the primary network. So, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, yeah, so this would, this would be quite a bit more. Right. So for this, um, at the conference this year, you know, that would be awesome uh, to be able to bring that up. And, and you know do a, do a demo at the 500 watt level. But what is the um, uh, title of your talk going to be this year at the conference? Uh, well, it's going to be it's going to be about the MAGAMF um, and synthesizing energy um, via Eric's um, theory of parameter variation. And so um, the the um, embodiment of it will be um, varying inductance, but um, the talk will cover um, a theory of parameter variation in general. Mm -hmm. So it'll be about synthesizing um, energy say. via changing the inductance. Now is that, um, and when you talk about energy synthesis, I know this is a, a term Eric has used for a long time, synthesizing energy and desynthesizing energy, and it looks like there was something like that going on with the cosmic induction generator when you and Eric were doing measurements showing that you had a certain output from the radio transmitter and then it was it seemed to be just disappearing right in the middle of nowhere, right between the coils. It, where you could, it seemed that way point. that some of the RF was just um, not accountable for. Uh -huh. um, so we didn't, uh, I mean, so, we certainly... Mm -hmm didn't uh, have detailed measuring equipment available, but it seemed that there was something anomalous going on. Right. And those, and those charts and graphs of those tests, you have, I think it's posted on Eric's Facebook page, but it's also on your, your blog site, isn't it? I believe so, yeah. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> so if anybody's interested in, in some of that work John's been doing with the cosmic induction generator and some of the tests that he did with Eric showing that it looks like energy is literally just disappearing right in between the coils and can't account for it. Those graphs are on uh, John's website as well. And John's website address is johnpolakowskiscience.com. And um, so on the mag amp, when you're talking about um, uh, a magnetic amplifier designed by Eric, Eric and talking about synthesizing energy, is that what some people would basically say is, you know, so-called free energy or more energy is uh, appearing than what you can account for that you're putting into it? Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, it, it certainly takes um, energy putting into the, the, mag the magnetic amplifier to, um, to see some to, uh, energy gained. Um, and we haven't quantified yet how much is out versus in, but we have seen 
um, some energy created in a, in a um, strange fashion. Yeah, and you've been working on this for a couple of years, haven't you? Yeah, I sat down. I mean, I was working on the magnet a couple of years ago, and then I kind of put it to the side to work on the cosmic induction generator. But um, uh-huh. now I'm kind of revisiting it for this talk. And is um, any of your work on that, um, was some of it posted in energetic form? Um, I, did, I did not post it. Um, I was I was planning on writing a book about it, um, but huh. um, I, I should have some, I mean, I'm certainly going to be posting um, the results from our experiments here on the on the forum. Right. Yeah, so if you're, if you're listening on energeticforum.com, there's a uh, forum inside of the Renewable Energy Forum, which is Eric, Dollard, uh, Eric Dollard's forum. And inside there, there's an Eric Dollard thread. And uh, there's actually three. Two old ones are, are closed down just to kind of preserve the information so nothing happens to it. And then there's a more recent one that's been going on for a while and it has a lot of diagrams and people are posting replications that they've built based on some of Eric's designs. And I think recently, I don't know if it was maybe David Dawson or somebody might have um, posted some uh, papers on the magnetic amplifier. Did, do you know where he got, did he get those from you or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he got them from me a long time ago. Eric, um, for me um, on the output circuit of the magnetic amplifier, and um, I, I just never got around to posting them. But um, that is that is uh, one of the circuits that um, that I experimented with. Right. So you, are you going to be your are you? Besides um, giving a talk at the conference on this magnetic amplifier based on Eric's designs, um, are you going to be able to have a demo there, kind of like you did last? Oh yeah, absolutely. Are they pushing that too? Yeah, no, no promises on uh, on uh, uh, energy synthesis or, or more out than in, but um, we should be able to show some some cool stuff. And is that going to be something high pa- um, that's going to need a lot of power, like the cosmic induction generator, or is that something you can just pl- plug into no, the it's wall? No, that's pretty low power. Pretty low power? Okay. Yeah, it doesn't take very much. And, right. And so hey, are there any um, any updates or any anything else that you want to tell everybody about? Or Well, yeah, I'm going to be putting a bunch of updates on my website, um, particularly when I get back from from my week here, um, uh-huh. and um, I guess that's about it. Um, okay. Hey, um, Eric, is there anything that you want to add about the magnetic amplifier stuff that, that John's working on and that what he wants to share at the conference? Yeah, well, that's something we worked on years ago, and then I got rather disgruntled because none of the material appeared on the energetic form, and then basically lost interest in all of it and got into other things. So at any rate, it was uh, the outgrowth of a mathematical paper that I wrote at the same time on the production of electromotive force and the law of electromagnetic duction. And there's a third type of electromotive force production that's not considered and is by what's called parameter variation. And presently, I'm... uh, really twisting my brain trying to come with the next chapter on my book on my last presentation. Uh, These things take quite a bit of time to get together, and this is going to be a big one. And I found a paper by Steinmetz that uh, basically says that there is no definite relation between the energies in these type of systems. It's all based on the assumption of the conservation of energy, but mathematically it's never been proven that there is the law of conservation of energy applied to parametric variation type of electromotive force generation. So the whole idea is to come up with a system that does it with a static means without rotating equipment, and that's what the magnetic amplifier does. So a parametric EMF was generated, but in order to calculate the powers and energies going in and out, it takes a lot more meters and things that we have, and... This, the, the complication that I'm facing is 
there seems to be this notion running around that I have a laboratory. I do not have a laboratory. I have an ice box filled with junk. And uh, if we're lucky, we can find the right pieces to put something together. But uh, at any rate, I have to, out of my Social Security, feed people and pay for their gas here and pay for their gas back and pay their rent when they're gone from where they live. And uh, it's just simply too difficult for me to handle that. The, the donations that uh, come in to EPD laboratories is pretty much consumed in rent and insurance, and there's no way to actually make any progress on the building whatsoever with that amount of funding. And then the donations that I personally receive in the mail all go into the aforementioned expenses of paying John and Justin to uh, to work and all that. And a lot of that got eaten up when I went blind, and then there was a month I was out of business and, and all the food and gas and everything that was involved in moving me around and, and all of that uh, burned up another thousand dollars so basically it's not not really working out so good are, are we allowed to mention um, anything about the building situation on which is kind of some pretty good news I think well yeah we got the building uh, we have the original owner paid off which is a step forward uh, but unfortunately the insurance and lawyers and other parasitic entities that suck your blood uh, pretty much wiped out our bank account. And now uh, there's not really a lot we can do. Uh, the money that was donated for the long lines in the Telluric project has been pretty much spent up. We have everything we need for the overhead construction uh, for the most part. Um, but uh, what we needed to get that there was no more money for. Again, I paid for out of the Social Security, so there's $600 that had to be spent in, in wire grip hardware to hold the lines up and all that. So that pretty much wiped out one month's check. Mm -hmm. So the whole situation's a struggle, and then, you know, the process of me going blind and trying to fight that end of it has left me pretty well demoralized. I do want to mention something about the building. Um, you know, uh, as usual, there's the the normal and best information out there being spread around. And um, as far as the building is concerned, with the uh, person who was purchasing it from the original owners, um, EPD Labs has never defaulted on one single rent payment. Um, utilities have always been covered, insurance, and everything else. And um, basically, most of the money from the book sales, like books and videos, like if you go to ericpdollard.com, that's P for Paul, um, Eric's middle initial, ericpdollard.com, there's a books and videos link. And if you, if, uh, you purchase any of the books and videos in there, um, the proceeds from that is what has been paying the, uh, the lab's rent for o over the last year. I mean, probably a year and a half maybe. And uh, since Eric went to the first conference in 2013 up here. And since then, um, there was one donor, and with the money coming in from the book sales, EPD Labs has um, officially made a purchase. It's already been through the title company and everything. Um, a, a big chunk was already paid off, so the original owner is out of the picture. And the other owner who was basically involved with EPD Labs at one point has received every single payment um, due to him on time, and he is now the seller of the building to EPD Labs. And I don't want to say what the remaining balance is, but um, it's just it's a fraction of uh, what it used to be. And so, just so everybody knows, that a lot of the money that that has come in has actually went to purchasing the building, and that building can probably be paid off maybe in the next 18 months or a little bit quicker. You know, if we if we do another uh, like Indiegogo campaign or something like that uh, to basically just pay that off because that will free up um, you know, uh, probably close to about $1,000 a month uh, that can be going to parts and some of these other projects. Um, now on the, uh, yeah, so the, 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 biggest op the biggest obstacle we're facing here right now is the money to make this into a real workable facility. That's just the hardcore reality of the situation with the cost of everything this day and age. 
Right. That includes, you know, the, the, the purchase of the building, uh, the, uh, you know, the, how would you say, the, the paychecks for the people, to the two people that will be involved to help me that have been working with me on this and covering all their, you know, the legal requirements of this and that and the taxes and the whole thing. And, and unfortunately, you know, in a lot of places, we don't have polls up yet. Uh, there's still 20 that need to go up to carry the signals into the town. Uh, the present cost of utility pole erection with the cost of the poles, the cross arms, and the labor and everything is $2,000 per pole. And if we're looking at 30 poles, that's a good-sized chunk of money. Uh, the power company, this NV Energy, is a horrid organization that has one of the most unsafe, unreliable electrical systems probably in the entire planet, other than maybe someplace like in the Philippines or Bangkok or something. But uh, And they just uh, have to fight them in PUC. They will not offer 223 phase power anymore and they want $35,000 to put the connection in when we should already have it to begin with. It's going to cost another $35,000 in conduit and circuit breaker boxes and transformers and all this stuff. And uh, the whole thing just makes my head swim. You know, when I was 19 years old and I could get all this stuff for free for RCA, it was one thing. I built all this stuff. I built a number of giant facilities. Uh, which, you know, should be available to me now that I'm old and tired to enjoy. They've all been destroyed, and I'm not going to live another 30 years to put it back together unless I can find money and people to help me do it. It's, uh, that's the reality of the situation. Now, if, um, if you're listening and if you're not sure what the seismic stuff is about, um, there was a, um, a facility known, known as Landers, which was a huge, um, big piece of land that had a whole bunch of antennas on there, which um, Eric had a fully developed um, advanced seismic warning system that could show when uh, earthquakes like 6.0 and above were going to hit, what, two, two to three days ahead of time. Yeah, and about two days ahead of time. In fact, the Japan one came in, even though that was longer than the distance that the station was conceived to receive. It did come in on the overground to the ionosphere uh, almost exactly 48 hours before the main event and one hour before the foreshock earthquake. It sent the uh, ionospheric electrostatic uh, measurement chart off the scale, and it remained there until the time of the earthquake, and then it dissipated. But when the Landers facility got looted, all that stuff just vanished to the wind, so I have no proof of any of it, and my notebooks were stolen. These are all the, This is why I have such a nasty personality. Well, um, on, on ericpdollar.com, there's a, a section on there called the Long Lines Project and a few other sections where you can actually see a lot of the uh, uh, telephone poles that, that are in the ground near Eric's lab right now. And I think there's a few pictures um, of Justin's truck showing, bit, you know, like uh, thousands of feet of uh, like telephone wire and, and other stuff. And there's insulators and a whole bunch of stuff they've been um, taken out of the desert um, on old abandoned lines and stuff, and all that stuff is going to be going up on these poles. And if you want to see an actual walkthrough of landers um, in operation, um, if you go to uh, Eric's website and click on the books and videos page, because if you get his books and videos through there, um, Eric and EPD Labs receives 70% of the purchase of any of those books and videos. So they get... Um, and that's what helps to uh, pay the rent. But on the video, which is called Extra Luminal Transmission Systems of Tesla and Alexanderson, on that page, there's an extra video you can get, which is, which is a, um, uh, basically a, like a four-hour walkthrough on Landers, where you can actually see the whole facility working. And one question that I see come up quite a bit, like for example, on, on your Facebook page, is people are always asking, well, why just this earthquake stuff? And the answer is, with this type of antenna line, earthquakes is just one application, but there's actually a whole bunch of different types of experiments um, related to all this Tesla transmission type stuff that you can do on these same lines. Is that correct? Yeah. It's, uh, originally, this is conceived as a Navy submarine communication system, and, and all this material was never intended to be released. And I was going to go strictly through the government uh, 
grant procedure and all that uh, when the Landris facility was intact and progress was going on that, but then a bunch of real estate scams and uh, and this so-called group that uh, always gets in and makes sure that I lose my place to operate. Uh, the place was put up for a quarter million dollars ransom, and uh, the cops threw me out of my own place, and uh, ransom wasn't paid, and the place was looted. So then later with this EPD Laboratories, as a lot of people probably know, my organization was hijacked uh, by some Islamic or whatever that's a whole subject in itself, and then all the security of the situation was compromised uh, so that the naval applications were obviated, and that basically cut the Navy out of the whole thing right then and there. They were the big losers out of the situation, and I'm just stuck with the earthquake end of it. And so the material that, that I had chosen not to disseminate, like the video of Landers and equations and things in my presentations, I decided to put it out anyway because it doesn't matter at this point. Now, with um, now year, years ago in Bolinas, California, there was the RCA station there, and that was basically a fully functional Alexanderson network, which actually was used by the Navy for a ship, ship to ship. Yeah, yeah I'd say, uh, it was actually one of the first ones. So uh -huh. the, two, the two original Alexanderson units that operate in the um, the so-called scalar mode where there's no propagation, it's instantaneous. Okay, I got a bad line echo there. So, yeah, so Belenus was actually the first full embodiment of, of the Alexanderson patent superimposed on the original Marconi system, and then in parallel, uh, the same thing was happening in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, when I got there... In 1966, most of that was all gone. But the people that worked on it were still alive, and they had taught me what they knew about it, but it appears that the information was modified and things were left out so that I was operating under a delusion for many, many years of how that particular transmission structure operated that it is not really an antenna, it does not radiate electromagnetic waves, it's a transmission structure for communicating into and out of the physical mass of the Earth. So what happened was, as the situation started to get really bad there with common wheel smashing the equipment and, and vandalizing antenna structures, and my installation in Bolinas was bulldozed by the SWAT team under the insistence of common wheel and, and their people, is... Uh, Basically, uh, I forced the Park Service uh, to allow me entry into the facility to do an archaeological study of it. So it was kind of a risky situation the way I assaulted them. I expected to go to jail, but I had them in such a bind that uh, they agreed to do this, and they hired a local historian, Dewey Livingston, to help me. This is all the stuff that's out now published in what I call the RCA book. Uh -huh. And in doing this study, everything was favorable. Uh, some idiot, uh, Commonwealth idiot, had started a major wildland fire there, and it burned all the brush in the antenna field, which worked very well for me because then I could see where the guy anchors and and uh, various coil platforms and everything were positioned. And there were massive rainstorms that year from some kind of uh, related voodoo event so that I could dig down in the ground. And so what I did is I completely built up a, um, an archaeological representation of the antenna by the positions and the geometries of all the original stuff and did the calculations and then found out that this was something more fantastic than I'd ever realized. And then I built my advancement on that concept at Landers, which took it, the step, took it one step beyond Alexanderson. Uh -huh. In layman's terms, what, what would the uh, improvement on Alexanderson's system be? So the problem with both the Tesla and Alexanderson systems is they only operate on one frequency. They're highly resonant, and they tend to store a lot of energy at that resonant frequency. So they're sluggish to respond. You can't modulate them, or you cannot use them to receive a full audio spectrum. But 30 years of mathematical work on my part and then rediscovering the Alexanderson principle and then 
some laboratory and experimental work, I came up with a way to do this, both the Tesla and the Alexanderson method of transmission with these analog networks that covers the full audio spectrum. So that way you can hear the full spectrum of the electrical signals that are originating from within the physical mass of the Earth without any distortion. And that's a, a basically patentable. No one else has done that before. So that's presently uh, what John and I right now are trying, you know, step by step to get these networks together with what we have. But there's so many coils and so many capacitors, you know, the whole thing just wants to turn into a big jumbled mass of wires and what have you. So we have to mount all these things with terminal strips. And Well, John's mostly been doing that right now. I'm struggling with trying to get the next chapter together in my book on things that no one has ever been able to provide the answers to, yet I can't write a book on transmission engineering that nobody understands. So I have to come up with answers to why these forces exist and why inductance capacitance and all that type of stuff. So the previous chapter has gone out on the energetic form and ultimately probably properly should be placed on my website for people that are interested in the very end of it. It took me quite a long time to get all that together and it was uh, a rather I was rather elated at the results and the theoretical insight that I got from it. So now I'm attempting to apply that to the actual physical forces that are exerted on the conductor and how the ether exerts those forces even though we know absolutely nothing about the ether. So I'm trying to come up with some kind of concept that's workable and is not too far from reality. It's, it's really twisting my brain inside out. So right now my, I'm kind of in a weirded state by all of it. I'm just exasperated because it's like, you know, trying to drive through mud and you're just not getting anywhere. It's slow progress. So I did, did find, John found the Steinmetz paper on the subject and once you find a paper by Steinmetz on the subject, everything becomes crystal clear. So at any rate, I think right now, and that's what I was working on just before, the telephone thing is I'm actually able now to start writing the chapter. Right. Now, the um, the book that you refer to as the RCA book, um, if uh, anybody wants to uh, get a copy of that, you can go to Eric's, uh, ericpdollar.com. And in the, the book section there, um, it's called Wireless Giant of the Pacific. And that's actually the name of um, – that station in Bolinas was known as the Wireless Giant of the Pacific. And the concept is this extraluminal transmission, which basically means there is no speed or um, velocity to the transmission from one point to another. It's like instantaneous at, at the other end, which kind of – goes against a lot of the, this Einsteinian stuff, but the um, Dewey Livingston, the, the historical uh, or historian from the Park Services, uh, his book is included in that. That's known as, and he titled that Wireless Giant of the Pacific. And then Eric's book that he calls um, uh, the RCA book, um, that's also called the Wireless Giant of the Pacific, but it's a different book from Dewey Livingston's. And that one goes into a lot of newspaper articles. Uh, it shows a lot of um, just a lot of the stuff that happened at that facility a lot of diagrams and equations, and the the network that you're working on with John right now, aren't some of those diagrams actually in that book? Uh, not exactly. So, so no, I, I had I had not developed the network at that time. So so far, uh, that network hasn't really been fully displayed publicly. Okay. Uh, I did I did get into it very briefly in my last presentation, but only, you know, just to show a variety of forms of networks, that was one network that was included. Mm -hmm. So so from here, like, um, uh, if you're working on the other chapter of the book, there's kind of another direction that you're taking um, for the uh, 2015 conference coming up in the middle of July. And um, do you want to go into a little bit about what, what you're going to be talking on there and... Uh, there's a composer in uh, Seattle who's kind of helping you out on some of this music stuff? Yeah, well, this one's going to be even more difficult. So right now I'm, I'm at that initial position on it where I'm completely overwhelmed and don't know which way to go. But uh, after spending a couple of weeks in Lone Pine, 
and thinking about the subject, and there's a guy there that is helping me with this project. In fact, he's the one that started it off. In fact, he started off all of it. He, uh, him and a couple other people there initiated the Lone Pines writing and a bunch of other stuff. So, so he's continuing to work with me on the uh, power of music subject. Uh-huh. So the and thing is, uh, how, the thing is providing anything, you know, from an engineering or a quantitative standpoint of how ancient people could lift giant stones with sounds, well, I'm at a complete loss right now on how to uh, explain that, but at any rate, what I have to do is, uh, this will, is, will be based on a, a book called Music of the Spheres by a person named Jamie James. So if anyone wants to get a warm-up on this subject, I would recommend reading that book and then... That book resulted in me writing two papers. Uh, one was called Verser Algebra, I believe it was, uh, From Stymets to Pythagoras, Backwards in Time. And then there's a companion to that called the Camp David Antenna. And that both of those deal with the, the Verser concept as related to sacred geometries and music and an actual antenna that you can build that works, a type of Alexanderson antenna that's wideband that can be used for ham radio or HF communications in general, but it never was uh, actually tested in a shipboard environment or whatever, but at our experimental facility, which we call Camp David in Belenus, we did build a working model, and we were successful in communicating between a Tesla transformer from there and a Tesla transformer in Los Angeles between San Francisco and Los Angeles is a rather sizable distance, and the signals were remarkably strong. So that was a good step forward. But again, before, when things got finalized and we were finally at the point which we had a working facility, it was destroyed. And, and those two papers that you mentioned about um, Pythagoras and Steinmetz and his Camp David antenna, these are um, in the Lone Pine writings, either in the first no. or second book? Uh, uh, I don't know. They might be, uh, but I'm not certain. I'd have to. They conceivably, okay, might be, be but, but I'm not certain. Yeah. So if you're listening to this, um, you can go to ericpdollar.com, and again in the book section, there's a link to Lone Pine Writings. And I'd encourage you to use use the links on Eric's website to go there, so that EPD um, Labs and Eric um, receive the proceeds from those sales. And you can look at the, um, the home page for that Lone Pine Writings, and you can look at the description of what's included in the first book and um, the second book. Um, and actually, those papers were posted for free in energetic form. Um, might take you a little while to kind of scan through there and find it. But um, if you want to support Eric's work, uh, you can get a copy where it's all compiled right there in, uh, in the Lone Pine Writings. Um, and so, are there any kind of other updates or? Anything you want to share with it, uh, anybody that's been uh, going on recently or going to get to some questions pretty soon? Or? Well, I think that kind of covers it. So, you know, as far as uh, the outside plant project goes, I mean, we're looking pretty good. I expect, you know, as long as I don't need, if I need an eye surgery in my other eye, that will basically, I will no longer be able to operate because I'm still partially blind in the one that got repaired. And then if both of them are out, that will pretty much put a stop to everything. So I don't know exactly what's going on. I'll find out next week. Uh, it creates a very difficult situation for me because I live in my car. And, of course, if I can't drive, i got nowhere to live. Uh, what I faced last time is there's nowhere for me to recuperate from these things. So, again, I fall victim to, uh, you know, having to deal with people I've dealt with in the past. Uh, which are infiltrated by uh, various negative elements. And in this case, when I was recuperating, the place is infiltrated by Russians, and they damaged my car as uh, retribution for me staying at this guy's place. And uh, I'm really starting to get sick of all this stuff, as uh, mm -hmm. people that are listening might be gathering that I'm kind of getting fed up. Yeah. yeah it, it, um so if you all haven't heard the news, um, Eric did recently have surgery for a detached retina. And so that's, that's kind of what he's referring to. Um, <clears throat> and I do want to mention um, on John, johnpolakowskiscience.com and also ericpdollard.com, 
Um, if you want to support, support their work, you can also donate directly through PayPal, and um, uh, that'll help them out. There's also addresses in case you want to, uh, if you're able to mail a you know money order or check or anything. Um, definitely purchasing any of the books and videos through their websites also helps them. And um, they're both going to be doing presentations at the 2015 Energy Science and Technology Conference. And if you want info, info on that, um, it's on energyscienceconference.com. Uh, it'll be July 10, 11, and 12, which is um, a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the middle of July in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is about four, maybe 45 minutes um, east of Spokane, Washington. Uh, so it's right by the uh, Washington-Idaho border. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, John, do you have I just, anything I wanted, to add? Or, or? Yeah, I wanted to add that I, I, I need to update the mailing address on my website. The current mailing address on it is not is not correct. I've since moved. Um, okay. So, but your uh, PayPal still wait. works? Yep. My PayPal still works, yeah, and any donations are, are very happily um, received. I, I struggle to make it up to the lab every time. Um, but it's it's definitely great to be out here and be making progress. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and uh, open up for questions. Um, and if you do have a question, um, you can hit five star sign, and that'll flash a little question mark up um, uh, next to you. So I know that you have a question. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, somebody with the last four digits of six eight zero six. Go ahead and go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, my name is uh, Dan. I uh, just want to thank you guys for the work you guys are doing. Great stuff. Um, I have a question for Eric. Uh, I sent him some pictures about a demonstration where an experimenter put, puts a conventional radio inside uh, two tin boxes, and it only shows static, as you would expect. But when he puts that same radio in the near field of a TMT, the, the signal is able to penetrate the boxes. And I thought that was uh, interesting because it showed it was in a electromagnetic wave. So the question is, what would Eric's advice be to replicate something like that? Is the extra coil necessary for that effect? And how we could apply Tesla's system to communications in general? Did you catch that, Eric? Yeah. Yeah, I saw it. Somebody uh, sent me that in the mail, and I saw it. So it's definitely... A working example of a longitudinal dielectric induction because it doesn't generate any magnetic field, so there's no way the metal can counteract it. So the lines of force simply terminate on one side of the metal and, and go outside the other. Uh, the exact parameters of the coil were not made clear, so the only thing you can do is just experiment with the regular primary, secondary type of arrangements. Uh, I did uh, this, what I call the Crystal Radio Initiative, gave all the design information on constructing the resonant coils with the primary and secondary. So it pretty much can be handled from there. You just have to pick your frequency or, you know, what size wire or how big you want to build the thing and then scale it from that. It's all algebraic. It's, it should be pretty basic, but you do have to have at least some level of technical knowledge. It's not... It's not a beginner's thing. You have to know how to use algebra and build things and all that. But uh, at any rate, uh, I was satisfied with the experiment that it did demonstrate that a longitudinal dielectric transmission can penetrate a electromagnetic shield. Great, thanks. Okay, thanks for your question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, somebody with the last four digits of five four zero three. Um, Greetings, you I'm Al, and I'm on Maui, Hawaii, otherwise known as NH seven O on the air. I have a question for Eric when he was mentioning early on about the difference between a ohmic connection to the ground and a capacitive connection to the ground, how that affects the uh, system that he's working with there. Um, you know, we, in our, in, <coughs> in our uh, normal antennas, try to get, uh, say, a vertical antenna on 160. You, you need a, a fairly extensive ground radio, which is capacitive. 
uh, in his system, it sounds like he wants to make an omic contact. So how do those two things really differ? Well, ultimately, I'd rather not make an omic contact, but that's the way that I can get the best aperture for conveying energy in and out of the transmission network. Well, if the capacitive one has the advantage and there's no energy losses, and then it can become part of the reactance of the network, uh, the disadvantage with the capacitance method is I have to run the impedance much, much higher on the transmission network so that I can get a capacitor current. I need a higher voltage, and that tends to uh, reduce the bandwidth of the system and uh, lower its operating frequency. So that's what we're experimenting with right now on the bench is to try to see if we can come up with a reasonable network that will have a frequency response from about 200 to 20 kilocycles and that won't be disturbed by being connected to these capacitive probes in the ground, uh, which are the big complication right here because this rock is so solid. I can't use plant roots like I did at Landers or like I can do at the other installation in the Mojave Desert where we have those creosote bushes available. So somehow I'm going to have to find the money and or the means to drill 30-foot uh, boreholes into the ground and then put pieces of copper pipe down in there as capacitance electrodes. That's basically how I'm planning on doing it. Okay, very interesting. Um, in the uh, use of a typical, uh, you know, uh, vertical antenna uh, array where you have several verticals in phase, for instance, end fire phasing. Um, would you say that the, the Alexanderson system is essentially phased ground rods uh, in, in analogy to that? Yeah, it's, a, it's like a broadside array, but it's it's basically ground ground rods rather than than air elements, and also it's monopolar, so that there's no plus or minus. So being that using the ground as the active terminal, it doesn't leave anything to ground to. So uh, this network, just like the Tesla transformer, creates a self-referencing situation, kind of similar where, you know, if you were hanging on a rope and you tried to, to push your car, normally the car wouldn't move and you would push yourself backwards, but in this case... Uh, your body wouldn't move and the car would move. In other words, the action-reaction process has been neutralized. That's what's novel about this. A conventional electromagnetic transmission system does not want to work like that, uh, not easily anyway, even though in my research station at Landers, I did manage to voltage feed a halfway vertical element with a uh, quadruple energy network consisting of uh, two inductance energies and two capacitance energies and was able to excite that in a monopolar fashion, eliminating any need for grounds or ground radials or what have you. I see. Very interesting. Is the Alexanderson antenna at all directional? Uh, it can be directional if you uh, uh, design the transmission network so it has uh, some kind of finite velocity, whether it be slower or faster than light but then that causes a phase shift along the, along the network, and then there's a phase shift in the grounding elements, and that will cause a directional characteristic of the antenna, as indicated in the Alexanderson patents. And it seemed to work for RCA, but it's very difficult for me to determine a lot of this stuff experimentally because of the sheer effort of such projects. I see. Well, thank you very much, and good luck to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, let's see. Okay, next person. Um, the last four digits. Your phone number is eight zero two seven. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, Eric. My name okay, is Ken. Yeah. I live in Northern California. And uh, basic, kind of a basic question for you. But um, when you're looking at the, you know, the whole, the the, the benefits and the design of of uh, a longitudinal transmission system. First off, I'm assuming that the primary difference is that instead of having um, the the transmission line directly coming out of your your transmitter and going into a coil, it goes into a primary, which then which is then goes into a ground and secondary, which then actually ends up being the transmission element. Um, but what are some of the other benefits of a transmission of that a transmission system of that type um, other than just speed? Well, the benefits are is a lot less attenuation 
uh, to the point where you could actually convey energy by that means. So that was a challenge I put forth on this Crystal Radio Initiative and the Energetic Forum. Uh, the winner of the prize would be someone that lit a 100-watt light bulb off of uh, AM radio stations somewhere, you know, like 15 or 20 miles away. The only complication with that is that the grounding system would be about the same proportions as that of the transmitting station, which would be 120 wires about 500 feet long and a giant star radial, and that's beyond the capabilities of the average person. But somebody did actually manage to get it to work to the point where they ran a small motor off AM radio stations, power that was extracted from the coil by longitudinal transmission means. Now, with that, with that type of system, um, is do you have to have exact matching in terms of frequency to be able to to receive the signal? Yeah, yeah. Both networks have to be fairly proportional to each other to some extent. They have to be on the same frequency. In the case of the AM radio station, obviously a good quantity of the energy of the AM radio station is lost electromagnetically in the space, so it's not the most efficient way to create a longitudinal transmission in the ground, but the fact that it is transmitting current into the ground as well as the antenna, because it's bipolar, and the fact that the antenna is a resonance structure and causes a large rise in uh, displacement current and electromotive force, then AM radio station basically transmits half of its wave in the ground and half of its wave in the air. Uh, I just did an experiment with that in our a more distant facility out in uh, the Mojave Desert where I had available to me five miles of underground phone cable that was uh, basically what's called H-loaded, so that meant Every 6,000 feet, there's a splice pedestal, and it was filled with coils, which were not particularly needed for what I was doing, so I sectionalized the antenna, the coils we're using right now to build the Alexanderson networks here. And uh, I tried the video, and it might be a little rough or whatever. We, none of our pictorial material on the last three months and uh, $15,000 worth of effort has come out yet, but, but when it does, you will see that I took a small pocket AM radio, and I held it up, and I tuned around, and there was a fairly remote location. Maybe there was like five or six strong stations that came in. And then what I did is I took one section of telephone cable going one way, 6,000 feet, and the other section of telephone cable going the other way, 6,000 feet, and didn't bother to configure pairs or do anything fancy. I just took the shields of the cables and made a one-turn coil, and then put the AM radio, which has its loop stick uh, magnetic coil on the inside of it, and aligned the turns. Then when I turned through the AM band, every conceivable AM radio station that could be received, like in the western United States, all came in loud and clear. So this is a direct indication that the underground mode is much more effective than the overground mode for AM radio reception. Amazing. And yet, just just the fundamental principle of under of uh, in ground transmission means that you're obviously not using a transverse wave. You're using what I would consider to be. I'm assuming assuming when you say longitudinal wave, that that would be analogous to let's say a compression wave. Um, yeah, either it's, it's 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 kind of you know not enough experiments have been done to really put like definite terms on things. So what these waves are in the ground, I. I I cannot keep a facility working long enough or have not been able to and other circumstances, you know, like RCA going under and all this type of stuff. I just haven't been able to do all the experiments to come up with the exact details on these. But I view it basically as a as like earth currents. That's what gives rise uh, to these telluric signals is earth currents and their associated magnetic fields. So there's all these magnetic storms and turbulences in the Earth's magnetic field, and these are associated with currents that flow in the ground, and that's pretty much how Tesla viewed it as currents, but now whether these are conduction currents or displacement currents, uh, you know, that the ratio between those two is not quite figured out yet, but it's not strictly conduction current because uh, the, the ground in the Mojave Desert 
is all uh, granite-based, and the ground here is all fused volcanic ash, and neither of those support conduction current, yet in the Mojave with the, uh, the telephone cable, uh, which was not buried in the ground so deep that there would be any conductions currents, it was only buried about two feet, then it's definitely a dielectric type of process involved. Interesting. So one final question. Um, I think it's a, actually I just I think that just to kind of throw it in, I think the work that you're doing is just really remarkable, and and I want to thank you very much for you know pursuing it and being willing to you know go through all the trials and nonsense you have to go through your life to finally get to where you are and and uh, still being productive. Um, so I really really want to recognize you and and honor you for that. Well, the thing uh, I always say is, you know, no matter how hard you whip a coyote, it's still going to eat chickens and enjoy every minute of it. (laughs) (laughs) And leave lots of feathers and bones. (laughs) Well, you've got to share a certain amount with the crows because they found the chicken for you most likely. That's right, man. It's all all cooperative (laughs) one way or another. so, so I think that the work that you're doing with the, the seismic and telluric system is, is really amazing. And obviously, I'm sure that you, there's a lot of offshoots of, of where this technology will develop. Um, are you seeing that eventually you could design um, a fairly easy to implement uh, telluric monitoring system where if you had like a whole series of these things over a geographical territory, you could literally get a visual uh, telluric energy map um, of that region? Well, that's that's what I would like to do, but, you know, then we're up into about a billion-dollar price tag. Yeah. So and there's no way, you know, that any of this stuff can be done without some kind of very serious corporation. You know, at one point, you know, RCA, you know, it started me on this. They didn't really know why. Neither them nor myself knew that it would turn out this way, but it kind of would have had to because the satellites were putting the point to point and ship to shore out of business, and they turned to me to come up with a way around that. And uh, I didn't know anything about Tesla. They didn't know anything about Tesla, but it turned out to be that was the route to go. But there is no more RCA, and there's no more. Uh, there was a situation here that uh, if I could have got some kind of uh, some backing uh, for the project, Bell Telephone would have supported it, or whatever Bell Telephone had turned into, or whatever's left of Bell Telephone, and that uh, fell on some internationalists that were going to involve Siemens and all that, but they turned out to be money scammers, and uh, story of my life, and the phone company ripped the whole thing down, and so now basically... You know, I'm just doing basic, this stuff is my social security and donations I receive in the mail and, uh, you know, a building that I can at least work on my car and write my notes. And that's uh, very, very slow progress, particularly, you know, when you get old and tired of it. So just out of curiosity, I don't know, why how, the heck how, to, how to get a grant, you know, the Navy, I wanted to go the Navy route, but that's been compromised by... What I call the Gang of Four that hijacked my organization and caused the loss of our security clearance. So that's not happening. Uh, uh, universities are probably going to shy away from it because it's anti Einstein. Uh, in fact, you know, some of this stuff, even things that the power company normally utilizes in their daily operation for their systems, if you describe these phenomena to the physicists, they become absolutely violent. Uh, you know, in rejecting it, even though you can go right on the switchboard and read it off the instruments. Wow. So I don't know what to say. It's a, it's a hopeless situation, really. You know, unless Would you say, a 55-gallon drum of gold nuggets just crashes out of a spaceship, lands in the backyard, I don't know what to do. There's really nothing I can do other than crawl along. Would you say that this type of, of uh, resistance and just kind of, attitudinal um, dismissal of, of the type of work you're doing is just only prevalent within the United States, or do you say that there's other areas that might be a little more well, it's even worse. it's even worse, if in, if worse in Europe. In fact, if it wasn't for the United States, we'd still be burning kerosene for light. Hmm. 
South they America. They were so wrapped up in all their elegant mathematical theories and all their their bull that uh, there's no way that anybody could progress. Uh, you know, so Heaviside turned on them. Steinmetz turned on them. You know, Steinmetz moved here. Tesla moved here. Edison was already here. You know, and the numerous people that they gathered around them to support this uh, made it happen. But then the Einstein phenomena entered in the situation and just basically obliterated all their work and threw it back into where it was before, where it's just a sea of incomprehensible equations that have no connection to reality whatsoever. And trillions and trillions of dollars are spent on fooling around with that stuff and building giant apparatus that basically a lot of that stuff you could do with a simple, you know, 5 or 10 kilowatt Tesla device, but they have to have their giant magnets and their giant lasers and so and then, uh, basically, American society is on the verge of collapse. In fact, it already has collapsed. There is no longer a civilization in this country. It's pure barbary and aggression. And uh, there's no, when you're dealing with, you know, a subhuman species, the type that now populates America, they have no interest in anything except the next stimulation. And then when, you know, they're done with the coffee, the cup just falls to the floor and the wind gets it. So it's hopeless. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I mean, being, being an observer and an advocate of this field for many years, um, you know, I feel like that at the very least, just to be able to kind of codify and document and, and verify and validate the information um, really is key because you know otherwise it gets lost and nobody has a clue. And uh, well, that's what that's what we're attempting to do now with you know the facilities that have been made available to us. And this time the facilities have been made available to us by the government, you know the government agencies here, and, uh, and they're very supportive and they want to see this done and they do not want anybody to screw it up. That's an improvement over before. Uh, but, you know, I, the warehouses of material, you know, and the level of vitality that I had and, you know, and, and all the support from different directions is all gone. So, you know, now I'm at a point in life where I am somewhat financially independent, you know, as far as living as a coyote in my car in the bushes. I don't have to really worry about spending money except on, you know, projects and all that because I have no overhead. And I have, you know, developed this high level of theoretical knowledge in a, in a position now where, you know, I should be able to enjoy the so-called golden years. Well, that's about the time that my body takes a crap. Yeah. Oh, boy. There's nothing, and there's nothing left to work with. I already built all this. You know, I spent my whole life putting all this together to have this, you know, in my elder years, and it's gone. And I don't, you know, someone's going to have to cough up a big chunk of cash uh, to make any of this happen within my projected lifespan. I mean, already we're looking at two years, two to three years being consumed just to set up these basic transmission systems that I've been talking about, the 50 poles we have here in the Great Basin and the 50 poles that we have in the Mojave Desert. And there's still, you know, so many things that need to be done with the wires on those poles and all the grounding and, and you know, the cabinets and the racks, and uh, I don't know. So, I mean, we'll probably have something that we can demonstrate in a very cautious fashion, but it will be demonstrated, like, you know, we've done with the Landers thing, but it will be demonstrated much more analytically, and that's all that I can see right now, and I'm hoping... You know, that will bring some kind of research and development grant where then, you know, we can try to move ahead at some kind of decent rate in this thing. But like I say, is this this descent into savagery and aggression here in the United States has created the complete absence of a technological infrastructure that can do anything functional at all anymore. Thank you very much. I okay. appreciate your your comments. Okay, thanks for your questions. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, getting my lunch here. Mm. 
Uh, you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, I wondered if there's any way of uh, uh, de developing a 10 kilowatt unit that could power a home. No, this, this stuff is not intended for electrical generating. It's not, it's not a free energy system. Okay. Well, um, I might be able to help and raise some money. I have some ideas. I'll get in contact with you and see about coming up. I'm, uh, uh, I have raised money in the past for various ventures. Thank you. Okay. See somebody with the last four digits nine zero three seven. Um, hello, my name is Nick from Atlanta. Um, I had a question about that book, Prodigal Genius by J.J. O'Neill. Uh, Tesla said that no matter can be attained from no no energy can be attained from the atom, but O'Neill said that Tesla, Tesla's agreement was probably more of a psychological need for consistency. Do you think that was true, Eric? Yeah, that's a very difficult question to answer because there's so many interpretations of where the energy could come from you know, with atomic dissociation. So Tesla uh, kind of was stuck in some of his uh, reaction against uh, things that he saw going on in science that were wrong. So he was uh, he would kind of come up with some kind of overt statement that that wasn't necessarily totally accurate. But the one thing of interest uh, with Tesla's research and his statements is, is there is a very good possibility that radioactivity does not originate from within the matter, but it results from external causes from bombardment of these Tesla rays or cosmic rays, as he referred to them. Uh, I do have some, trying to get some experiments out on the Internet to get a, some basic equipment set up for trying to move ahead in this, but there's so many unknowns. Uh, I, I really don't know where to begin on that. So, But I wouldn't say that it's an absolute that you cannot get atomic energy out of matter, considering if somebody did. But then my theory is, is that the so-called atomic bomb uh, does not derive its energy output from any atomic process, but somehow short circuits the dielectric field of the Earth and derives its energy by that means. There were some experiments done by the Navy that I was told about by one of the people that did the experiments, who was a trustworthy engineer, uh, Chris Carson, who appeared in a lot of our earlier videos. Unfortunately, he died. But uh, there was no propagation delay in the, uh, the impulse produced by the nuclear blast, which would indicate that something other than electromagnetism and energy is going on. So my theory, without any specific basis for it, is, is that ultimately Tesla is right, that the energy is being derived by some unknown external means. But I'm sticking my neck out on that. Okay. Um, in Steinmetz's electrical waves, discharges, and impulses, he says that in order to produce the magnetic field and the dielectric field, you need a power P, which is equal to the inductance voltage times the current for the magnetic field and the capacity current times the voltage for the dielectric. But if the, um, if the voltage and the current are just changes in the magnetic and dielectric field, then what produces those changes? What's it, I, I missed the last sentence. If um if the voltage and the current are changes in the dielectric and the magnetic field, how do you produce those changes to get the power? By varying something. So anytime that there's a variation in magnetic induction, that creates an electromotive force, and anytime there's a variation in dielectric induction, that creates a displacement current. So it's a it's a hand-in-hand -hand thing. So if the current is initiated, that will cause the accumulation or the disintegration of the dielectric induction. And if electromotive force is initiated, then that will cause 
the production or consumption of magnetic induction. And it should be pointed out that electrostatic potential and electromotive force, even though they're both called volts, are not the same. And conduction current and displacement current, even though they're called, both called amperes, are not the same. And I got in this into my last presentation, and I'm going to be getting much deeper into that in the book that I'm writing. So you actually have okay. four quantities involved uh, rather than two. There's two currents and two voltages, and all are active in any electric field situation. All right. And my next question is, I know you said that the dielectric lines of force terminate into counter space, but in one of your lectures, you also said that you, they could be thought of as terminating on a proton at one end and an electron on the other end. How do they? Uh, yeah, that's that's the that's the, uh, that's the standard J.J. Thompson view, and the the line of force does, for the dielectric does not exist in space; it exists in counter space. Okay. Where with the, mag with the magnetic, propagate? it's the other way around. How do they propagate if they're, you know, anchored that way? Longitudinally. So there tends to be no external broadside activity. It's all within the structure itself, within the line right. of force, where the magnetic is external to the line of force. There, There is only one system of lines of force, and that's the dielectric, and the magnetic is a result of those dielectric lines of force in some kind of motion or transverse variation. So to say magnetic lines of force is more of a mathematical term than a physical term as far as the J.J. Thompson concept goes, but Faraday originally conceived them as two separate lines of force, but when you, like I'm doing right now, try to figure out how these inductions cause the conductors to move about and things like that. Uh, the only way that that can be explained is if there's a primary line of force, as J.J. Thompson indicates, and secondary lines of force being the, the magnetism and the primary ones being the dielectric. And, and so far, that seems to be working out uh, very well in my explanation of, of how electrical fields cause the wires and transmission lines to move about. So, for example, if you have a short-circuited transmission line, there can be no electrostatic potential because it's short-circuited and all that's left is the magnetism, and what that does is it pushes the two wires apart because the spatial aspect of the ether wants to get out. So if you open-circuit the transmission line so there's no conduction current, but just electrostatic potential, that pulls the wires together because the counter-space aspect of the ether is trying to contract and then the mathematical relationship that I'm trying to hit upon that I cannot get any reference out of any physics books or anything that offers any meaningful or dimensionally consistent results is at what voltage and what current do the two forces cancel with no resultant force on the transmission line. All right. And um, I was watching a National Geographic documentary on lightning, and the guy, the physicist's whole catchphrase for the thing seemed to be, I don't know. So do you know what ball lightning is? Well, ball lightning seems to be something where the electrostatic gradient becomes so intense that the air starts to break down, and then it draws more lines of force into it, and it becomes uh, powered by the external field. It could be a radio frequency phenomenon. Uh, there was a person who did experiments with uh, very intense uh, magnetic inductance discharges, uh, which produce some very disruptive longitudinal waves. I showed that in that uh, early Borderland video. I think we called it the free energy video or something like that, where it actually uh, disrupted the video camera. Uh, there was a uh, kind of a huckster experimenter named Robert Golka that like to make big electrical fires and things like that. He was mostly in the destructive stuff and not science, and he was getting these big motor field coils and railway engines and uh, and uh, open circuiting them without a discharge resistance, which tends to produce an infinite EMF, and then the capacitance in the coil will cause it to produce a severe oscillation, and he had ball lightning running around, and also 
it's known on Navy submarines, which, of course, are powered by similar electric motors and direct current systems, that during switching operations, that, that ball lightning would jump out of the switchboard. Okay. And now, as far as lightning point. goes, uh, the physicist's concept of lightning, of course, is completely distorted like the physicist's concept of anything electrical. They'd rather not even talk about it at all. Uh, lightning is not something that's confined to the lightning strike. Uh, what happens is, is you might have one cubic mile of dielectric conduction sandwiched between the clouds and the earth, and somewhere in that field there's going to be something that disrupts it, like a piece of metal sticking in the air or a certain type of mineral in the ground or a radio tower or something will concentrate that field, and because the dielectric field exists in counter space and not space, uh, when saturation occurs, which is indicated by a streamer or some type of you know ionic breakdown of the atmosphere, uh, in dielectric saturation, the saturated element does not exclude any more concentration, which is what you normally expect in a saturation condition, but in counter space, it works the other way around, so it will draw more lines of force in, and it will enhance the saturation process further until all of a sudden you reach a point where there's enough ionization and that one cubic mile of dielectric induction will thunder transversely into the central column and expend all its energy there. That's similar to how my theory of the atomic bomb works. And that's basically how lightning operates. So the core of the lightning is not the, the dielectric event is just kind of a, a shadow of it or a, the, the part that you can see, but the rest of us, what's really going on in these massive surges of dielectric energy is the main reason why lightning discharges cause uh, extensive damage to relatively far away electrical and electronic devices because of these traveling waves that are produced. So it's not, lightning is not a linear phenomenon, it's a volumetric phenomenon. But uh, because the physicists say there is no dielectric field, then all they can see is the lightning and everything else is Einstein. So if it's a uh, horizontal saturation, how come to our eyes it looks like it's going vertically? Well, that's how the saturation occurs. So it's not necessarily something that's going to happen uniformly. Uh, it tends to, to make little jumps in 50 microsecond steps. And it's kind of an organizational thing. So that particular saturation fire does not, because it's not a conduction, it doesn't have to be exist at the same time from one end to the other. It's like the ball lightning. It can start in little individual spots. Okay. And I just had one more question. Um, okay. I know that by increasing the current, you reduce the inductance, right? Uh, in a saturation condition. So Otherwise, the current has no effect on the inductance, only if there's something in the inductive field that saturates, like iron or nickel or something where the atomic process can only handle so much magnetism, and then once it's saturated, it excludes the rest, so then the inductance no longer exists because there's nothing to hold the field, so you're just left with the residual inductance that would exist if there was nothing in the middle. So if on the other side of the of the whole thing, if you increase the voltage in the dielectric equation, does that increase or reduce the capacitance? That will increase the capacitance during saturation interval. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Okay, let's see. Um, it's going on three twenty five, so we've been on here. Uh, almost hour and a half. Are you still good to go, Eric and John? Yeah, I'm fine. You good? Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, next person uh, that wants to ask a question, last four, do, last four of your phone number is 7465. Uh, you should be unmuted. You can go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, um, have you heard of uh, the... The the uh, the Witts uh, quantum energy generator, the QEG they call it. No. Tesla's, uh, 
Sounds like it's similar to your cosmic generator. They have it working. It creates like 10 kilowatts. I mean, 40 kilowatts, sorry. Kilovolts. Yeah. Yeah, well, if, if you Google it and then if you YouTube it, it's everywhere now. I mean, it's, it's actually, um, I mean, everywhere you go, you see it. People are building it. They, they say they have like 100 already built. Now you're saying this is some type of electrical generating device? Based on a resonance. Based on Tesla's uh, resonating, uh, uh, resonating um, um, steel with copper uh, around the steel, and that uh, creates an induction, which creates the voltage uh, to the um, to that device. And then you can they take the voltage and it feeds itself, and also it can feed your house. Well, I don't know anything about that, so I would have to see yeah. some diagrams or something. So voltage is not energy, so there's a lot of other factors involved. Before it becomes energy, it sounds kind of like one of these same old things where it all sounds good and uh, everyone's convinced, but it doesn't do anything. So I can't really comment on it unless I got one sitting in front of me and I got meters connected to it. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah it's based on... Based on the Eklund patent, I believe, um, I'd recommend going to Energetic Forum, finding the thread on that QEG, and reading both of Peter Lindemann's comments on it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, we'll do. Okay. And look forward to meeting you guys uh, at the conference. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, somebody else with the last four digits, 9289. Okay, you're unmuted. You can go ahead and ask, ask your question. Uh, hello. Uh, so I... Hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear? Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. I work in uh, with alternative medicine, and I'm here. I know very little about what you guys are talking about, but I'm trying to figure out that... <clears throat> why one of the things that I use, which is a um, pulsed electromagnetic field mat, is, uh, you know, it's helping to heal people when some of that is kind of understood how that's working or re really what the end effects are. But something that we learned about it, the new uh, knowledge for everybody, is that when people, there are some workers I don't know what the situation is. They have a daily um, mild exposure to radiation. They were testing positive for radiation exposure. They started using the mat before and after their work periods, and they no longer test positive for radiation. So, <laughs> they, you know, um, just I already had these notions that um, electrons maybe are just are more like waves, right? And I can tell in the body in healing, I had stage four melanoma. I could feel waves going through my skin, and so I'm just really, I couldn't even tell you what a wave is. So this is not my field, but I was most curious about the, you know, what's, hap what's happening to that radiation in this pulsed electromagnetic field, and it's, it's 0.4 Gauss is it's the strongest strength that it emits. So now what you're saying is that radioactivity disappears or some symptoms of radioactivity disappear? Well, um, just being tested during their testing, it's not there. And I don't know, because this is in Italy and I don't know these people, I don't know if, they're, if they were even experiencing any symptoms. I don't know if they're digging uranium or, I, you know, if they're working in a nuclear power plant. I don't know. I don't have any other data. Yeah, it doesn't really help trying to figure out how anything works. There's not really enough information. Well, ju but just that the insertion, of, well, but something else that, you know, made me curious and made me, you know, want to get to, to know your work in as much as I might understand it at some point, uh, is that these maths that I use use um, the uh, Schumann resonances. One of them uses the main node, 
One of them may have the harmonics. But, well, the harmonics are in there anyway because it's a sawtooth wave. So, you know, it, in, somehow it's working with the, you know, the energy that's here, and, and maybe that's unavoidable, you know, the energy bubble that we're in. Um, so I just thought I'd throw it out there and see if you had any notions. Well, but we find, we find in any studies that they've done on hands-on healing, interestingly, whether it's Qigong or Reiki, it doesn't matter, or any kind of hands-on healing, they usually find the Shimon resonances. They thought they were emitting from the healer, but in fact, it, it's just a tuning between the healer and the healee. So, you know, so there you are. I just thought I'd see if you had any notions about it. Yeah, I don't. It's kind of not really enough information to do any figuring. Okay. So I don't think I can help you out too much on that. I mean, I could come up with a well, bunch of wild speculations, but, you know, it's no point in that. Yeah, on your eyes, though, you know, I don't know what what you've got going on there, but if you maybe um, could have those frequencies around you, it might, might help your eyes heal quicker, the Schumann resonances. Yeah, I don't know. That's... Uh, there's already plenty of that stuff floating around from all these power line harmonics and the rest of it. I think the best thing to do is to get away from all that, but I'm not certain. So, But I have my my own methods. A living food diet is how I heal my body. But then well, I also have to consider my environmental uh, conditions. You know, I live outside when it might be, you know, 10, 12 degrees. And uh, it's freezing, you know, freezing conditions and that wind blowing in my face all the time. Uh, it's probably not doing anything good for my eyes. Probably not, no. No. Well, okay, well, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, um, somebody with the last four, 7707, um, you're unmuted. You can go and ask your question. Uh, yeah, I thought I was in queue there, but I guess I wasn't. I've been waiting a while here. Um, my name is Wayne, and I'm calling from Victoria. BC, Canada, and uh, so I have a few questions here. Uh, I guess the thing that's might be a little bit off topic, but um, I was watching a YouTube video the other night about your Borderland video, uh, where you had a, a light bulb and you were powering one with a 60 cycle current, and the other was some sort of high uh, frequency energy or voltage or something. And there was a, a foil strip that was being attracted to the bulb. And so I'm just really curious about that effect. And I was wondering what sort of uh, circuit or power supply uh, you had or what configuration you had with that. Uh, that equipment I do not have anymore. Uh, that was a... Uh the power supply was a large te uh, medical Tesla coil uh, made by Fisher. There's a guy named Mark McKay that duplicated this, and we showed it at, at one of the earlier conventions. So you basically have to have, uh, in this case, a pair of transformers, and they have to be very carefully matched to the source of, uh, of impulse discharges from this medical coil. And then once you get these transient oscillatory waves, then the uh, the Tesla rays start coming off of the filament of the bulb. And the bulb is actually operating more like the sun than it is an incandescent bulb. So then all of these related phenomena start to make their appearance around it, but trying to come up with any, you know, quantitative description of, uh, of these phenomena is a little, a little far out there with a lot without doing a lot more experiments and, and thinking on the matter. And that equipment is no longer available to me and it's not a line of my research right now. Not that I'm not interested in it, but I can't do everything. And just the sheer lack of materials, we'd like to put another modulator together, a radar modulator to replace the Fisher Medical Unit to get cleaner waveforms and all that. And any of these uh, transformers, whether they be for the cosmic induction generator or the crystal radio initiative or any of that, are all basically of the same dimensions. Uh, they can be run on any different type of power, transmit, receive, or even used radionically if you wish. But 
putting together that modulator is a big project, and there's just no way I can do any further research on that. The only thing I can suggest is go through all of Tesla's articles and uh, and his lectures on these various rays and his experiments, and he might be able to give you a little more insight on the matter. Yeah, I've been reading through one of his one of his lectures, and uh, he's talking a lot about um, light bulbs emitting rays, uh, and he talks a lot about rapidly varying currents and disruptive discharges. And I thought, I don't know if it's my concept of it is too simplistic. Um, I don't what you're describing to me. I, I'm not familiar with, although I have uh, a fair bit of experience with. Um, I built a Tesla coil out of microwave oven parts, and so I fooled around with this stuff, and I've been able to light neon bulbs at a distance without wires. Um, and kind of what I what I was thinking is maybe if the frequency was higher or the potentials were higher, that I could light an incandescent bulb um, with just a basic uh, primary capacitor, spark gap, and larger secondary coil. Uh, not sure if if I'm on the right track there, or if I'm if my my apparatus is too simplistic. What do you think? Yeah, well, it's, it's, the tuning and matching is what's really important. Uh, whatever was in the Borderland video and whatever Mark McKay uh, duplicated, I think that information can all be found. I'm not certain about it, but usually when I made those videos, I made every attempt to do such. Uh, Actually, this was originally done as a public demonstration for the U.S. Psychotronics Association uh, convention they had in Colorado, uh, but unfortunately, them, like the Tesla Society, uh, they promptly suppress all of my material once uh, my presentation is complete, and none of it's available to the public. You will not be able to find it anywhere. Uh, I was lucky enough to get some of my more recent lectures out. But that took quite a fight and a lot of threatening against me of being sued and, and all that kind of stuff. But we did manage to get them out. Uh, I believe, I don't know, right now we have this Islamic character is managing to get him pulled off of YouTube. No, they're uh, back so up. I don't even know if they're there anymore. Yeah, they're back up. Okay. Oh. Most of this stuff is out of my control. You know, I live in my car. I don't have any Internet or any of that. My... My, where, where are you located? C-47. Where do you guys work Park. from? Where? You, where? Uh, right, right now, we're in central Nevada. I'm not too enthused about giving out the exact location, but we're in central Nevada right now. That's where the building exists. Uh, otherwise, I live in about a 200-square-mile uh, equilateral, or you know, 200-mile each side equilateral triangle uh, with Death Valley in the middle, and that's pretty much my home somewhere between the eastern Sierras and out into the Great Basin. Okay. I was thinking you're up in the uh, Idaho area now, given that you've been involved with... Uh... No, the Idaho is not really... Too many fences and gates, oh, yeah. so I didn't really find that suitable. Uh, Oregon, Oregon seemed to work a little better. I uh, did manage to find a place where I could live in the wilderness in Oregon, well, it's a little more difficult in the winter there because of the snow, and uh, right now, because of my problem with my eyes, is I have to remain close to uh, my social worker and the medical facilities in Lone Pine in case something takes a squat on me here. I don't want to be out in the middle of nowhere and then trying to get done on some emergency level, and it, and it doesn't work out, so I'm confined right now. Well, I hope things change for you pretty quick. Yeah, I hope so, too. <laughs> we'll um, so, fast-changing, I'm just trying to go back here uh, to my question here, was uh, the high, is, it, is it as simple as the high-frequency alternations of, um, like, the long... No, it has, small, to be, it, has, it has to be a transient. A transient, yeah, so like a, a very fast blast of a periodic coil. Periodic transient, sine, sine waves will not do this type of stuff. Right. It has to be some kind of modulated envelope or it has to be a series of transients. So there's okay. two aspects to uh, Tesla's work. You know, one was strictly sine waves and the other one was strictly right. impulses. 
uh, later on, he denied his impulse work for whatever reasons. I don't know. But, but Tesla, Tesla fooled around a lot. So, you know, he would say things, and then he'd say something else. And so you can't always go by what Tesla said. But at any rate, uh, those lectures that made him famous with his vacuum tube uh, experiments and the articles he wrote relating to those things are pretty revealing. Uh-huh. The, the light bulbs, like, are, are in modern. Time, in his time, you know, a lot of this stuff was not understood. Tesla was, you know, ahead of his time. The things that we take for granted, like the Henry and Farad and stuff like that, hadn't even been conceived of yet. You know, these ether theories and everything were still very vague. Tesla worked almost strictly experimentally and not analytically. And, and ultimately, we will never really fully understand the extent of his work because this capitalistic uh, mind virus that, that spread across all those people there in New York at that time, Steinmetz and all the rest of them, basically precluded any possibility of uh, you know this ever being made scientific. It was all done for money making. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're kind that's of what, that's what was running the show. It was was money making, not science. Yeah, we have the same issue up here uh, with our oil fields and our our government wants to create this huge natural gas pipeline and all this kind of stuff. So it's like more of the same of, you know, are we ever going to get out of this, you know, living in the dark ages? So Yeah, basically things fared, uh, fared the best for, you know, people into this kind of research during monarchies. Mm-hmm. Monarchies are the best, uh, the best form of system for progress, and that's how you know the Age of Enlightenment and all that came into being because the monarchs supported it. But once this disease of capitalism and its counterpole communism were created, uh, then there was no interest in that stuff anymore. It was strictly some type of gain or control. Mm-hmm. And now well, we've gone to the other side. Uh, there's no turning back, so it's a lost situation. We we are back in the dark ages, and it's getting darker. Mm. So so uh, if you wanna just going sorry. Yeah, um, I was going to say if you wanted to check with uh, Mark McKay, um, he has some write ups on that experiment that he replicated of uh, Eric's, you know, that medical that diathermy machine. And um, his username in energetic form is Spokane One. That's the digit one. And um, if you private messaged him or started a thread on on this machine, um, he'll probably just upload uh, some papers he put together on that whole thing with all the specs and everything. So, in case anybody wants to replicate what he did, um, uh, we were going to put that up. I think he had some edits and stuff he had to do, but he, he might have those done by now. And he's always, you know, open to sharing his, his work. And I think on energyscienceforum.com, there's pictures uh, from either 2013. The 2013 conference is when he had that, and Eric helped tune it up and, and get it uh, to get it working. And I think he, he also brought it in last year's conference. So you can see some pictures of it. But I'd encourage you to um, private message him or post a thread at Energetic Forum uh, to Spokane One, and, and he'll, he'll probably post the papers on all that. Sounds good. Uh, can I just, there's one other point here I wanted to kind of uh, address, or um, and it's related to Thomas Townsend Brown and um, some of my experiments and what he wrote about and what he did with uh, regards to high voltage uh, sudden changes uh, across capacitors with um, high dielectric uh, constants and uh, large masses. And uh, it seems that when these like when these capacitors are suddenly charged, like during that time, there's a, a thrust observed. And um, I, I sort of see this similar thing with your experiment with the light bulb and the, the force that's produced. And um, so I'm just wondering if you're familiar with Thomas, or Thomas Townsend Brown's work and electrogravitics and yeah, not, not too much. 
I mean, I've, I've seen it. I've, I've, I went production. through it. Yeah. But I didn't really... There wasn't anything there that really got me excited because it was all, like, very small quantities and it was all direct current orientated. Mm-hmm. It's the yeah. idea, I think, is, is uh, the impulse. I'm right? not the, you know, that well-versed on the details of it. Yeah. So I can't really comment on, on the relationship between that and and Tesla's description of how these vacuum tubes operate. So pretty much I I work from the theoretical standpoint of J.J. Thompson and the experimental standpoints of Nikola Tesla, and that's what I base my conceptions of things on, which, of course, are not very popular in the world of physics. Right. Okay, uh, one other little thing I think it might be. Uh, Verser versus phaser. I did some college courses in circuit analysis and we learned about phaser diagrams and, and vectors and um, I'm not sure your your terminology of Verser, is that is that the same thing as phaser diagrams or are we talking about well, no, a phaser, is something that, a phaser is something that's dynamic but, but the Verser is strictly a position. It's like you know, the divisions on the clock. So the, the first real popularization of that concept was the use of uh, the imaginary, imaginary operator by Steinmetz, but he misinterpreted it as a vector. But actually it's a verser operation, and then because the versers were related to quaternions, which uh, were despised by Heaviside, and were really a useless mess because... Uh, People really did not know how to extend the concept of complex numbers. Uh, the Verser thing just basically vanished. So the problem is, is when you start getting into polyphase power systems, you have to return to the Verser concept. So I wrote quite a bit of material on that, uh, but it's extremely difficult to get published because of the complexity and and. The so we would I wouldn't find I wouldn't find Verser stuff in in textbooks in electrical engineering. Is that what I'm... No, well, they're basically any electrical engineering textbooks for the most part are going to be useless to get into any really in-depth understanding of anything. You know, unless you go back to the day of, like, Steinmetz, and, and he, of course, is highly mathematical. Uh, the champion of uh, Verser mathematics is a guy named uh, Dr. Alexander McFarland that operated out of the University of Austin, Texas, and also in Edinburgh, in the United Kingdom. And he it was his mathematical papers that got me started on this whole process, along with, you know, Steinmetz's application to alternating current theory, where basically all the equations are Verser equations. They're not really vectoral anymore. But you're using what are called Verser operators. So I should have a book coming out on the theory of that before long, hopefully. Uh, even though there seems to be some kind of complication, I just can't can't seem to get it untangled or whatever, which basically has made me give up on it. But I did write something, and maybe one of these days it'll get out somehow. But it's you know it's from a mathematical theoretical standpoint. Uh, the practice, practical application in engineering is what's called uh, the method of symmetrical components. But again, they try to turn it into a phaser and vector situation, and that just completely erases the whole idea of the versa and creates all these complexities that makes what few books on the subject exist almost incomprehensible. And, uh, and they offer no theoretical basis for what they're doing, so that's why I came up with my material. So the other the thing verse. with versers is the versers connect also to musical scales, so the concept is expandable, and it's probably expandable, I don't know how far, but this is what's going to be in my next presentation on electricity and music. It's, it actually can carry all the way to the theory of numbers and numerology itself. Oh. But I, I have, uh, you know, I, I'm inventing all this stuff basically on my own, and I can't, all these mathematicians and stuff, you know, that write to me and whatever, nobody can even help me with the most basic basic uh, elements of this stuff. I'm just strictly on my own. 
So the versers, they relate the uh, scalar quantities, like the uh, dielectric uh, um, fields. Is that what you're? Is that kind of correct or? Right. Uh, the the, the verser, the verser is normally used in the time cycle. So a, a verser is a matter of position. It's right. where you're at in the cycle. It's a verser position, like like the hour marks on the clock. Those are right. versers. There's no the, the hand length is always the same. That doesn't vary. There's no vector involved there. It's strictly a verser. It's a position you could remove the hand and just put a light bulb, you know, behind the number. There is no length involved. The verser is strictly a matter of position. Okay. So if if oh. you're changing positions in, in an alternating current system from one phase to another. Uh, then that's a verser operation. They go from phase A to B in a three-phase system is a verser operation, which is a 120-degree shift. Okay. So if, if you have phase A as unit value of 10 volts and you have phase B that's 8 volts, well, then phase B has to be preceded by a verser operator, which indicates that that voltage has moved in its cyclic position to another spot, which is identified by that verser operator. So normally, uh, the letter J is used for that in the 90-degree configuration, which is called an imaginary operator, and then all of this mathematical you know, justification is given for it, which is not really correct, and leads to a bunch of confusion. Yeah. Hey, uh, Eric, could I cut in yeah. with a question? Yeah. Uh, my name's my name's Chris. I'm in Wisconsin. And along these lines with the math you're talking about, I'm wondering what you think about Rodin's vortex math. I don't know anything about that. I wonder if it doesn't hold quite a bit of information for you because here's where it comes from. It comes from Tesla's quote where he says, if you can understand the 3, 6, and the 9, you have powers into his imagination. Well, that goes back you, to the and you name. talked about the neurological about, thing. That's no longer that's no longer a strictly physical process anymore. Well, correct. But but what I'm looking at is I'm seeing the um, that now they've got creations called rodents coils. People are looking at rodents coils, windings of wires, and they're finding strange phenomena in certain geometric windings, which are representative of Tesla's three six nine and the vortex math that Rodin does. And so the, yeah, the vortex that's, map, I think that's a little that's going to be a little little beyond me right now. I can't take on another study. I'm already saturated. Well, I think, I think, yeah, I think it's going to I think though that there's a there's a connection there because this math is describing waves in motion in three dimensions and how all of the math whether it's addition, subtraction, whether it's uh, division or multiplication or even exponential or fractional it all comes back to the singularity of nine, and it goes through zero, zero to nine, and it and it helps simplify the math in wave form. Yeah, well, it sounds interesting. It's, it's I, I'd, encourage to the, I'd encourage you to. Well, I can't, like I say, I can't, I can't, I can't take on any more material. I'm saturated. People send me piles and piles of stuff to read. I got a book I'm trying to finish. I have a presentation I'm trying to put together. I got sure, a car to sure. work on. Uh, you know, I can't. I can't take on any more material. Sure. I just wondered if it might help you in your, uh, you know, obstacles that if you see some of this representation math, you might simplify some problems you're having. Yeah, possibly, but. Right now, my main problem is trying to figure out how to make this connection between ether and induction and motion of conductors, and that's got my head filled to where it can't handle anymore. And then at the same time, I have to figure out how to put this power of music presentation together. With uh, that sounds fascinating. Well, that that will be tied. That ties into the number thing you're talking about. Have you heard so about maybe, maybe, maybe by the time members? maybe by the time that I make that presentation. Uh, I might have come up with something with regard to that. Have you heard of a gentleman named Dan Winters? He does some work in that area in terms of resonance and waves and music and you know, how the waves are fractions or repeating uh, repeating symmetrical 
you know, octaves. Um, Dan Winters has done some great work with that. Okay. He's done, well, I mean, uh, uh, he, because uh, people are always free to send me copies of this stuff in the mail, you know, and uh, okay. I, I usually go through it. You know, in the course of the day, and answering everybody's letters and what have you. That's uh, if you have anything that you think is interesting, uh, send it to my general delivery address in Lone Pine. Okay, well, thanks, Eric, and I made a donation to your PayPal account, and I appreciate your efforts, and I wish you the best of good health. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. We have. Um, Let's see, somebody with the last four of the phone number, 4953, you're unmuted if you want to ask a question. And if we can kind of um, be brief with the questions, um, we're, we're getting on two hours here. So we want to yes. <clears throat> uh, hi, thank you. My name is Aaron, and um, I just uh, had a I, – I kind of was turned on to uh, your work, Eric, um, less than a year ago, um, and I find it extremely fascinating. I think um, – you're very unappreciated, uh, and unfortunately, I, ju I just uh, want to express my gratitude um, for the work that you've been doing and getting out there and sharing despite all of the, um, you know, challenges you've been facing. And uh, uh, once I'm able to uh, donate financially to your cause, I definitely will. Until um, then, uh, you know, any of my current skill set that might benefit your work, uh, I would I, I so you know open to uh, anything you might need. Although um, much of what I do has nothing to do with uh, electrical engineering or anything like that. Um, I'm more of a media person. Um, but uh, my question in general, um, uh, I was curious. Uh, much like the the last person who was just talking about the rodin coil, and uh, there's another um, gentleman out there whose work I believe uh, parallels yours. Um, although, and I know that you're not a big fan of physics. Or, the, or physicists in particular, but uh, this gentleman, he's a he's a theoretical physicist, but he's, in, he's he has the same opinion that you do about the whole study in general, about how it's just very dogmatic. Um, his name is Nassim Haramine. I'm not, I'm just curious if you're familiar with his work. No, I'm not. Okay, um, I might send you some stuff um, that I find that I think you know. He talks a lot specifically about um, his theories of the sun and the activity of the sun and it being electrical and hollow. Also, the Earth uh, expanding. Yeah, well, that's that's and, something I'm definitely interested in because that's my belief also. And he he wrote um, he has a paper I believe it's under peer review right now. Um, that's the his version of the unified field theory. Um, and he just has an amazing way of it's everything is mathematically um, perfect. You know, it's, it, he pretty much solves everything that we observe uh, in the universe. Um, and it, it's very interesting the way it kind of comes full circle to uh, really kind of it, it backs up a lot of the spiritual teachings of thousands of years. Uh, it has a lot to do with uh, fractal geometry. I mean, it's all basically based in fractal geometry, and he speaks a lot of harmonics, octaves, and things like this. Um, and I just, I just saw him speak uh, recently, just a couple of weeks ago at the Conscious Life Expo, and I had asked him if he was familiar with your work, and he said no. Um, so I, I just I can't help but feel that the two of you guys, if, if you guys were somehow to come together, it would it would be like like exponential, like. Uh, your work just seems to support each other um, to an amazing degree, and uh, I know that there's something there. I, I can't explain it, but I know that there's something there. Yeah, well, that would be interesting. Maybe, uh, at any rate, you know, you can uh, send them some of my material and send me some of his material, and we'll see what happens. I, I will. Uh, I'll do that. I'd love to be able to facilitate that if I can. And okay. uh, I wish you the best uh, of health, and I hope you heal up soon. And I'll continue to follow your work, and um, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, um, we're hitting on two hours here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm beginning to lose steam, so maybe a couple more questions, and then I think that'll be it for today. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, somebody with the last four digits, 3968. Maybe we can hang on for another 15 minutes, then we'll wrap it up. Um, you should be unmuted. You can ask your question. Uh, last four digits, 3968. 
Hello, this is Tim from Florida. Just appreciate Eric's uh, sharing with us his uh, immense study and all the study he's done. Uh, those of us who drink every drop that falls from him, we uh, really appreciate it. I only have a simple question. Maybe it's very complicated, but I'm trying to understand uh, what is a magnetic field. If you took the volume that we call a magnetic field, what is inside that volume that you understand, or what are your thoughts about that? It's basically a phenomenon of the ether. Yeah, it's a phenomenon of the ether that's polarized and in motion. And to take it any farther than that, uh, you know, then just involves spirit, you know, speculation. So you understand the magnetic field not to be static, like a capacitive field, but to be dynamic and be in motion. Well, both the dielectric and the magnetic field have a dynamic aspect within the ether. So with the uh, dielectric aspect, the motions are confined into an internal structure, but with the magnetic aspect, they're externalized. So if we have a, a, a conductor with a constant, steady DC current going through it, there's a magnetic field around that conductor. Would you say that magnetic field is static, or is it circulating around the conductor? Uh, the magnetic field as a whole is static, but the ether is in the process of a circulation. And that's what's producing the force on the conductor. Okay, interesting. So, has there been so any the, experiments that the, you know of? Well, it's is not really measure? something you can get your fingers into. That's the problem. It's the ether. It has no physical existence, even though it's a substance. Uh, what I can do is refer you to a book uh, written by J.J. Thompson called Electricity and Matter, where these basic theories are laid out in a uh, very elementary form, not involving it much mathematics at all. It's very descriptive. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Okay, this thing. Just, um, let's see. Okay, last four digits, 6163. Uh, you're unmuted at Hi, Aaron. Uh, this is Jeff in Idaho. Can you hear yes, me? Go ahead. This yes. is Jeff in Idaho. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I, emailed, I emailed you the stuff with, about William Line last year and spent the evening with him uh, with his health conditions, uh, showing him how to increase his pH uh, with his health issues and talking about, to John Bandini about his throat. Uh, for Eric, I think that might be a good thing also. If if you look at uh, uh, Jeffrey Tennant, uh, he's studied... Uh, how to, the body heals itself. Uh, it's called voltages healing, and uh, he's got a, uh, an addition for the eye. What you have to do is you have to bring the uh, the differential voltage between the inner and outer cells above negative 0.25 volts. And the easiest way I've found to do that is to increase the the blood pH. And uh, I've increased my mom's pH after she needed a double knee amputation to basically get the wounds off at home and uh, with ozone and colloidal silver. And uh, if you flow about four ounces a day of uh, colloidal silver, the uh, log of 10 of the, um, the pH of the colloidal silver will bring the, uh, the arterial, if you do an arterial gl uh, blood glass measurement, up to about half a percent over the optimum healing rate of 7.45. You've got to get the blood pH up to that where the body will heal. And, Eric, even though you're on your natural food diet, I think this would go in a, a good direction. If someone, if Aaron could uh, download like a Kindle version of uh, Jerry Tennant's work and he's got an eye version of Voltage is Healing, I think that would help you uh, uh, with getting your eyes back because we don't want to lose you from the standpoint of, uh, you know, all those things. I have a, um, I have a person I've uh, sent Ken Wheeler's work to uh, that's a, a super scientist and, uh, you know, he's very metaphysical and uh, leans in the direction of all the things we've talked about. And I'll try and put forward the uh, $850,000 proposal uh, for your stuff and uh, uh, if he could maybe uh, get you a visit I'll try and uh, I, got, I, I bought the Lander stuff and I'll make mention where it is on the internet but I had a question on the, when you look at Ken Wheeler's work and you look at your uh, wireless power theory uh, figure 5 a long time ago that's the simplified diagram of the uh, Tesla magnifying transformer right okay so between the two coils you essentially have I think the the, the dielectric plane that uh, is well documented in Ken's book, you know, in the uh, uh, the, the central flat plane. Can, do you do you do you understand what I'm saying? You've got the well. He never, he never sent he never sent me the book, so I never. Oh oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Familiar. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, well. Imagine imagine two cones that are like um 
let's say, 30 degrees coming into each other, and at the point mm-hmm. they meet where they get the smallest, that's essentially the extinction ratio with with this Ken Winters, this Dan Winters guy is doing. It's essentially uh, you, you essentially the golden mean fold inward and fractally until you get so small that you reach uh, critical uh, self-focusing, and you get these real nonlinear effects of these oscillation things that we talk about with transients with Tesla, and you get essentially uh, you, you remember on your um, your analog of music harmony one rhythm two uh, melody three those right. those dimensions are uh, in the dielectric plane in the very center where it flattens out and it starts to spiral uh, that's the center of the two coils in your uh, simplified diagram of the, um, the 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 Tesla coil okay all right so so what what you're doing is uh, in this pH system that I was trying to get to is uh, you're, you're the, when you take the, the volt, uh, when you take the pH on the blood up, you're storing more uh, energy in counter space. So what happens is the the uh, you know how you had uh, in one paragraph of that uh, the power, wireless power you mentioned uh, Wil, uh, uh, Wilhelm Reich and how you right. know, those those elements mix. Well, this is one thing I'm combining a lot of different things and your seminal work and these other things where. That uh, your simplified diagram is actually essentially the, the foundation of life there, and essentially Ken Wheeler's work. If you if you take your figure five from your uh, the thing that you've uh, you've written on, that's essentially the Ken Wheeler work. And uh, okay. so I just want to kind of convey that to you if possible. Uh, uh, I'll try and get some information on uh, that. But if Aaron, if you could like uh, download and read uh, Voltage's Healing, the I version from Jerry Tennant off of Amazon, you know. Uh, the, the easiest way I've found is to is to increase the pH safely, and uh, you you know like in cancer patients they take a lot like like a, like a cesium carbonate you know something that's super alkyl to raise the pH. But this is the safest way, and essentially the uh, uh, the Ken Wheeler uh, where the two the two cones point at each other. If you think of those counter rotating at each other, okay, and at the point where the uh, the dielectric plane is. That's essentially where it's storing that energy electrostatically. That's essentially, I think, what's going on organically with almost all life and stuff. And so for, for Eric's eye, the simplest thing is to, to nebulize four ounces of colloidal silver through like a one pint, like a glass bottle that's got like a silicon seal, and that'll increase the pH. There's a lot of people that, that do things like that. But uh, if you, Eric, if you've had an arterial gas blood measurement, you know, the, the, you know you've got to be above 7.45 in pH to have your body heal itself. Because what that means is there's a negative 0.25 to negative 0.3 volts of differential voltage between the inner and extracellular fluids. You well, I know that? about the alkali pH, and right. that's pretty much how I right. heal my body all along because I do not have the conventional all-American uh, battery acid uh, diet. Right. Well, well, what, what I'm saying is the simplest thing for you that I've done with my mom, I, they were going to basically do blow knee amputations for my mom. I came home with like uh, 25 square inches of wound area that was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, basically uh, dead tissue, and I soaked it off using, uh, I used charge exchange from ozone pumping sil- uh, colloidal silver to basically make a perfectly biological liquid, and it would slowly basically soak the wound off, and it would heal the edges, and the wound would slowly come off. And so by using that process, I found that, that uh, when the um, when the ozone would break down, it would release uh, uh, you know uh, one particle uh, for delta sigma oxygen at uh, like in the red, and then one in the near infrared. Well, those uh, energies when they optically pump the body, okay, they go in and they make single oxygen in the body, and you need as much single oxygen in your body. And this book by Ed McCabe, Flood Your Body with Oxygen, you know, or an alkaline diet, and all these other things. I found that uh, you know if, if if you basically break down if you break down ozone. And you wave guide it, you know. If you take if you take like um, Fe two O three, like a hematite little balls, and then you ozonate it, and you you basically break the ozone down into delta sigma oxygen that is really super healing. So if you reflect that down a silicon wave guide, you get a photodynamic therapy on your body. Okay, and, th- and this is what one of the ladies was talking about earlier when they use that pulsed electromagnetic field. What's going on is they're killing the parasites in the body. And the parasites are what store the radiation to make them live. They're living off the radiation fields inside your body to survive as a host. Yeah, that's interesting. That's what, that's what uh, Dr. Harold de Clark in that uh, Care and Prevention of All Cancer book that I had at uh, last year's uh, seminar that I was kind of showing around to a couple of people, like uh, when I was talking with um, with uh, Jim and uh, Paul uh, the Sunday night. So 
I'll email Aaron a couple things, uh, but if Aaron, if you could read that for him. But the simplest thing, and I showed this to uh, John Bendini. I showed the bottle and the pictures of my blo- mom's blood work. Just give him a call and mention, you know, that uh, Jeff that wanted to, you know, help him with his health was, you know, trying to convey the same thing to Eric because he remembers seeing the pictures of my mom's blood work. But I can email him if you're interested. But that's the simplest way to get you super healthy that doesn't have any other impacts. And it, it kills the parasites and these two. Um, these two colloidal silver particles, what they do is, I think they're in a monoatomic state and rotating against each other, and they're charging the dielectric field in between them. And so that's what raises your pH, because you're, you're internally electrostatically charging your body electrostatically. Does that make sense, Eric? Well, yeah, it's a lot of theory and speculation. So all right. I know is when I go to the uh, VA for a checkup, uh, right. is their instruments all read funny, and, and uh, they don't <laughs> recognize me as a human. And uh, one of the main complications seemed to be is my extremely high oxygen content. Right. That's what that's that's this, this, this is the system I'm telling you how this, what this does. I have my mom at uh, at 99 percent oxygen, and if you measure her her blood uh, her blood saturation, it's 164 instead of being like 60 to 85. It's like 166. It's as high as you can get. But yeah, that's what I, I have system. a different method of doing that, though. I do it with a living food diet that I live outside. And right, right. I get the I'm just same saying. results. Uh, one, one thing I did to really freak out some medical people once is uh, for two years there in the antenna field, the Bolinas, I had no shoes. Uh, I wore no shoes for two years. Right, you're grounded. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, none of the, nothing really affected me, the cold or wet or any of that, because I want a living food diet and I live outside. Uh, a process uh, that usually, unfortunately, happens when I'm running through the field is I tear my feet open on blackberry bushes. So right. what I did uh, is I was going to the nurse's office there because it appeared I had some complication from some something I got into in some surplus place or whatever. So I was having this sore on my arm tested. And, uh, and to show them uh, that I didn't have an infection process is what I did is with the wound on my foot as I went over to a cow patty with my bare foot and rubbed the open wound into the cow shit and then went to the doctor's office and asked him why I don't get an infection. Right, right. Well, well, the, that has to do with uh, like how high your pH is, because what happens is the uh, polymorphism of how many bo- uh, organisms are in your body, when the pH gets high and these electrostatic fields are, are, are what they are and they're rotating, essentially they basically produce enough voltage in the smaller DNA to short them out, and essentially that's what kills their, their, their life function, like what you're talking with the Wilhelm Reich, with the biome stuff. Right. Right. So... Uh, okay, that's uh, that's all I wanted to convey. But I'll try and pitch your proposal for the 850k to this one scientist, and I'll try and get him to get down to your area if he can kind of do that for you. Well, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hey, good luck today. Okay, see you. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, have you heard about the uh, the vortex theory by Dr. Russell Moon, the final theory of everything? Uh, who? The Dr. Theory, Russell? Dr. Russell uh-huh. Moon. No. I'm his number one student, and um, I'm going to go to the conference. I'll be able to meet you. But um, basically, the things that you're looking for is explained by this theory. Ether and everything. You should take a look at it. Yeah. The vortex the okay. theory.com. And when I visit you, I can bring some, uh, some books. Okay. And my name is Fabian, by the way. Yeah, or you can just uh, send me some brief material on it to my mailing address. I'd rather do it in person. You don't think going don't get too carried away because I can't. I only got so much room in my car, and anything that gets sent to me ultimately gets jettisoned because it competes for living space. <laughs> I hear you. I understand. Now, well, I'll just wait for the conference. I just uh, hand over some the books, a couple books that he's written that okay. on the internet. Yeah, Sounds and good. Uh, basically um, ex- explains everything. So, matter of fact, we've changed the speed of light, we've uh, transferred energy to uh, higher dimensional space and back again. We've uh, also uh, well, I'll tell you in person when I see you. Okay. Uh, if you just Google his name, Google's name, you'll see all the 34 publications worldwide. Yeah, I don't have access to any of that, so. And also, he's also the second person besides uh, um, Einstein to 
give an exact mathematical explanation for the Michael Samori experiment. Okay. Uh, which proves that that uh, uh, it proves it proves why time does not exist. Time is a function of motion. Yeah. I might disagree with that, but uh, at any rate, my interest is more in practical stuff, so I don't like getting too far out there in theory. Yeah, well, there's no theory. There's actually there's there's three proofs, but I I gotta show them to you in person. Okay. I spoke two of them. Yeah. It's pretty interesting stuff. But just to take a, I want to see, um, take a, make sure I bring a couple copies. Okay. Uh, um, that's all. <laughs> all right, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, everybody, um, thanks for being on the call. Um, again, make sure to check out John and Eric's websites, um, johnpolakowskiscience.com, ericpdollard.com. Um, again, if you're um, interested in some of the books and, and videos uh, based on their talks or any of the books that they have out, uh, purchasing those through their own websites is the best way to support them. You can also uh, make PayPal donations. Um, and there's addresses where you can send uh, check or money orders if you want to help uh, do donate to their work. Um, and also, middle of July, um, I would uh, register early. Uh, we're, we still have four and a half months till the conference, and already 50% of the chairs are already booked. And so even if you're not able to send in payment right away, go to energysciencefoam.com and at least fill out a registration form, even if you think that you might want to come, and then you can figure out the details later. Um, because there's still time to uh, send in uh, payment and everything. And so also on energeticforum.com, that's where um, Eric's forum is, where John posts a lot of his work. And uh, there's a lot of papers by Eric in there. And there are other people doing uh, different replications of some of Eric's uh, work, um, sharing pictures, diagrams, um, you know, schematics with that, all the details and what parts they're using and everything. So it's not just theory. I mean, people are making things that actually work and do what Eric says that they do. And so, I don't know, other than that, do you, you or um, John, do you have any, any final comments? No, I think uh, I'm pretty worn out, and I probably need to go uh, help John with what he's doing, so. Okay. So, I, All right. I think that wraps it up. Okay, well, appreciate your time, Eric, and uh, I'll be in touch. And again, everybody, I'll, I'll get this up on YouTube in the next couple of days. Uh, in case you want to listen to any of it again. And uh, thanks for being on the call. And thank, thank you and John for uh, your time. Okay. Well, you're welcome. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.